Hey everyone, welcome back. Today I want to talk about technology through the lens of a more modern author. As a disclaimer, this is a cursory glance at the fields I'll be talking about. There's obviously way more to these ideas than I can present here. Furthermore, I am not a technophobe, nor am I a technocrat. I use technology all the time and it is undeniably powerful. What I want to talk about is the fact that humans do care about and should continue to care about why we do things about the moral consequences of our actions, not just whether something can be done or can be made more efficient, as is often the goal of technology. I'll be using a few sources in this video, but in particular I'll be drawing from Yevgeny Morozov's book To Save Everything, Click Here, The Folly of Technological Solutionism. And it's one of the best books I've ever read, actually. It's a refreshingly active reading experience in that he isn't afraid to call people out, even if he does occasionally overstep. Ultimately, though, I think that adds a more human element to the book. If you care at all about moral philosophy and technology and where they collide in today's world, and how we can use technology in a way that still puts emphasis on the legacy of democracy and debate, check this book out. Morozov tackles two new ideas in his book for which he basically coins the terms. The first is solutionism, the propensity for technologically minded people to view inefficiencies in existing systems as problems which then require a solution. By solutionist thinking, technological change, which makes something more efficient, is a solution to a problem, and thus you should do it. This creates problems where previously there were none, and it also obscures the often sound moral reasoning behind existing systems. In the author's own words, To reject solutionism is to transcend the narrow-minded rationalistic mindset that recasts every instance of an efficiency deficit as an obstacle that needs to be overcome. The second thing Morozov talks about is internet centrism, which is much more strictly ideological in nature, and describes how the internet is talked about in mythologized terms, in which everything that the internet is perceived as standing for, openness, freedom, certainty, perfection, is necessarily good and must be proliferated, and that its inverse, opacity, restriction, ambiguity, imperfection, are fundamentally evil and must be vanquished. Much of this mindset is reductionist and boiled down to the success of the internet. I want to understand why and how iTunes or Wikipedia have become models to think about the future of politics. How have Zynga and Facebook become models to think about civic engagement? How have Yelps and Amazon's reviews become models to think about criticism? How has Google become a model for thinking about business and social innovation as if it had a coherent philosophy? so that books with titles like What Would Google Do? can become bestsellers. Solutionism and internet centrism obviously go hand in hand and feed off one another. They are deeply tied in with technocracy and positivism, but also piggyback on the ideas of neoliberalism and free market capitalism, along with many other very loaded ideas that I don't even have time to skim the surface of. As much as Morozov makes salient points about and proper takedowns of the misinformation and hype around technocracy and the internet-centric world we live in, it's obvious that at heart this book is really about the human aspect of the equation, and how those ideologies have endangered some of the ideals of democracy, morality, and liberty that we take for granted. Part 1. Technology and Solutionism Technology has always had a very central role in human society. The earliest forms of technology took the form of tools for hunting or fire for cooking. Now computers and software are the baseline for what we think of as technology. Humans are curious and love knowledge and its various technological boons. But in spite of this, humanity has never been a one-trick pony. We have never lent on technology alone. One of the first things you learn about solving problems in, for example, local councils and community organizations, is that you have to tackle things on many different levels a physical level, policy level, social, individual, and in a macro and micro sense. Where solutionism differs from this approach is where it identifies problems, which by virtue of the power of modern technologies is everywhere that inefficiency exists. As Morozov puts it, What worries me most is that, nowadays, the very availability of cheap and diverse digital fixes tells us what needs fixing. It's quite simple. The more fixes we have, the more problems we see. 
Increasingly, technology is taking on this mystical role as the one solution to all of our current problems, which creates a narrative where things previously recognized as okay become problems simply because of our newfound ability to improve their efficiency, not because a genuine need or desire to change them has arisen. I think it's fair to say that people do things because they either need to or they want to. In the case that they need to, efficiency and the drive to simplify make some degree of sense. If I need to cook my food but I don't enjoy doing so, it makes sense for me to use a method that's efficient. I personally like cooking. Recently I even cooked on an open fire pit in my front yard, and my room smells like wood smoke. It was very inefficient, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. When inefficiency is the result of a deliberate commitment, there is no need to eliminate it, even if the latest technologies can accomplish that in no time. Here is modernity in a nutshell. We are left with possibly better food, but without the joy of cooking. Framing cooking on a fire pit as a problem because it is inefficient is a solutionist conceit. This principle obviously can apply legitimately to things that we want to be more efficient. Solar cells and energy storage are good examples. But inefficiency in itself is not problematic. For as long as humans enjoy cooking, then the role of technology in cooking is not to make it continuously more efficient. Because in that framework, the aim of cooking as an activity is not efficiency. Another side effect of solutionism and the mythologization of technology becomes obvious when we consider a problem like climate change or the growing scarcity of non-renewable resources. It is often said that technology will eventually make those things non-issues. But we have here a disconnect between mythology and reality. This is reflected in Clark's third law, which you are probably familiar with in one form or another. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. What this reveals is what we are really saying when we claim that future technology will fix something. We are saying eventually we will have access to magic or magic-like abilities that will render our problems obsolete, which is a pretty precarious basket in which to place our precious and delicious eggs. In this case, the solutionist view is not only that technological progress will continue and the magic it provides will solve climate change for us, but also that there is no need to change your behavior, your consumption, economic model, or worldview, and no need to address the issue via any of the other avenues of problem solving we have traditionally relied upon. Democracy, for example, relies on robust debate, not just to fix problems, but in order to determine what a problem actually is, and we update that as often as is necessary with more debate and in a new context. How problems are identified matters. Asking how we can make politics efficient is the wrong question. Ellen Ullman gives a great summation of this in her New York Times review of Morozov's book when explaining the idea of solutionism. Efficiency is good. Politics is messy. Make politics efficient. This maxim of solutionism ignores that the reason that things become messy is that as soon as you introduce differing viewpoints about serious issues like rights, laws, and legislation, to protect the interests of people who don't even understand the implications of law, people debate, and debate is disagreement, and disagreement is messy. While we're on the subject, within political and moral debate, there is very rarely a clear-cut right and wrong when people disagree. The solution to a clash of values is almost always compromise and diplomacy, not education, which is a common idea that is, in my experience, actually kind of condescending. In summary, if only politics had brought us Twitter. It's so messy, it must be important. When we approach a question without considering how it was posed, we are inevitably armed with preconceptions of how the world works. Solutionism circumvents this whole process and leaves us with a profoundly diminished capability to navigate problems that may require us to consider more than efficiency. This is doubly ironic because technology is so synonymous with innovation Yet this movement towards efficiency specifically stifles new ideas in favor of increasingly efficient existing ones. Technology is powerful because it has a profound ability, among other things, to increase efficiency and to simplify. This is a common and often noble goal, but when efficiency becomes a good in and of itself, it is not necessarily a desirable one. Part 2. Internet Centrism Solutionism's partner in crime, according to Morozov, is internet centrism, which is the way we talk about the times we live in as being revolutionary because of the internet. 
where truths need to be questioned and examined and altered. And when we do inevitably alter them, we use the success of the internet as a model to think about how they should change. Internet centrism is bound up with solutionism very tightly. They grew up together and they feed off one another for their strength. This feeling of supposed revolution is actually a very normal thing to experience. Every generation has always thought they were living in exciting and revolutionary times, and they were all wrong, just as we are. Admittedly, with the possible exception of the hard limit of climate change, which is different in that it is a limit that is not artificially created by human technology or conflict. The internet, more than any other current technology, has become immensely mythologized. A common tendency being that instead of making laws and rules and regulations regarding the internet, we are constantly being told that we must adapt to it, as if it is a permanent being that now defines the way we should run society. The internet has become such an axiom that we can simply invoke the internet as an explanation and never have to elaborate what is meant by it. Morozov actually puts the phrase the internet in quotes throughout his whole book to further emphasize this. Often it is the commonplace, the innocuous things we say without thought that ought to be the most considered. As a thought exercise, consider this. What comes after the internet? Not what would life be like without the internet, some of us are old enough to remember that. But what comes next? Almost every time I've asked this question I get no real answer, and then I get several permutations of the internet but better. This lack of foresight is nothing of which to be ashamed. Every generation in history has suffered from it. But our ancestors' inability, and now our inability, to see further ahead than improving the system we already have, does not automatically mean we have reached our technological zenith. Because the internet is hailed as a revolution that has brought us all this information and all this data to people who didn't have it before, because it has brought us the digital age, which we now cannot see past, it becomes more than it truly is. The internet stops being a tool that we dominate and becomes a creed that dominates us. In many ways it's almost like a fandom that must be preserved, company to which Morozov admits he used to belong. I remember perfectly the thrill that comes from thinking that the lessons of Wikipedia or peer-to-peer -peer networking or Friendster or Skype could and should be applied absolutely everywhere. It's a very powerful set of hammers. And plenty of people, many of them in Silicon Valley, are dying to hear you cry, nail. This is especially frustrating because it should seem obvious to anyone who thinks about it that the internet is not one technology. The emerging military internet of 1966 and the World Wide Web as it was invented in 1989 were not the same as the social media soup we have today, with its heavy focus on marketing, advertisement and data. Something to highlight at this point is that the internet is not the web, another thing that we have lost track of that should remind us that the internet is not a single technology. The web was invented in 1989, the internet was invented in the 60s. Tim Berners-Lee invented the web which sits on top of the infrastructure of the internet, but they're kind of synonymous now. We've seen the internet change both in use and capacity, and we have seen its principles change too which makes the idea of the internet having any kind of consistent philosophy manifestly false. And yet, this belief in the internet as some kind of entity continues. This mythologization is how we get headlines like this. Headlines which can only exist while we extol the virtues of the internet without thinking about how we should use it or how we perhaps should be allowed to limit it, which we already do to an extent, like we limit any other public forum. Now, there have always been technophobes. But as I said before, this is not that. Inevitably, in these articles, the word Luddite will appear. If you are of the opinion that this is the case for Yevgeny Morozov, and this is all fear-mongering, then I invite you to read this article by Katrina Brooker, where she interviews Tim Berners-Lee, one of the two men who invented the World Wide Web, about his dismay at what the web has become. Here is a small grab from the article. While Silicon Valley started rideshare apps and social media networks without profoundly considering the consequences, Berners-Lee had spent the past three decades thinking about little else. From the beginning, in fact, Berners-Lee understood how the epic power of the web would radically transform governments, businesses, societies. We demonstrated that the web had failed instead of served humanity as it was supposed to have done, and failed in many places. The increasing centralization of the web, he says, 
has ended up producing, with no deliberate action of the people who designed the platform, a large-scale emergent phenomenon which is anti-human. The problem with labelling someone as a Luddite is that you mistake informed concern for misunderstanding, as if caution is somehow a hallmark of the internet illiterate when deciding how we use something very powerful, as opposed to it simply being prudent. This is a very dangerous mistake to make, especially within politics. It would be naive to think that because a politician like Joe Biden is old and thus doesn't understand the internet, that the US government is going to ignore that it exists. They helped invent it, by the way. And it's equally naive to imply that authoritarian regimes are constituted of imbeciles who couldn't possibly adapt to moving censorship and propaganda online, people whose sole occupational goal has long been political power and control. All this is not to say that there are not cases, many in fact, in which the internet and its openness and freedom and resistance to censorship has helped to liberate people or cast light on dark corners of the world. But news reporting which isn't run through a Twitter feed can also do this. Liberation is no feature unique to the internet, it belongs to humanity. You can see why Morozov calls internet centrism an ideology. Within its influence, the internet is then the height of technology and becomes a sort of deity, the principles of which we should employ in our businesses, our democracies, our policies, our lives, and never question. Obviously, the internet is not inherently bad or good. It depends how you use it. But to decide how to use it, we need debate. And in order to have honest debates about what space the internet occupies, it must first be liberated from this ideological assumption that it is revolutionary, unalterable, omnibenevolent, and must be protected in its current state at all costs. And those are the cornerstones of internet centrism. Part 3 the right thing and the right reason. Okay, so what do these ideologies and the direction they are moving technology in have anything to do with morality? Moreover, how do we know what the right thing is? That's obviously a very big question. Generally, we have some concept of what is wrong to do either socially or legally, and some experience to reflect on, and together those things guide the answer to that question. But what is the right reason to do something? Which rules do we account for when we reflect on that, and why do we choose them? That is a different question, and it intersects directly with technological solutionism. One such reason that you might do something is that, in return for your obedience, you get an, often financial, reward. Which is what we call incentivization. Incentivization is something that we have always used to try and get people to do something. The obvious example being a government, and a common incentive being tax breaks for small businesses, etc. Incentives are very simple tools, and they work well for getting people to do things. But incentivization isn't always a great moral thing to do, because as much as people will do the right thing, they may not do it for any good reason, and they may not think about why they do it. Incentives can then become normalized, which makes people less likely to do the right thing in other situations, unless they receive an incentive for that action also. Morozov points this out when he talks about gamification, which is the process through which we make things into games, by changing actions previously considered good or moral, into systems for making money, or increasingly for scoring social points. Sometimes explicitly with various apps posting the results of your virtue to Facebook or other social media. The problem here is that when technology incentivizes us to do something, or disincentivizes us to do another, and we endorse this, we draw closer to placing morality in the hands of tech moguls, and we get further from people picking up trash because it helps the environment, and closer to doing so because it is part of the game we are all now playing. Incentivization makes you less likely to do something in the future without an incentive. Additionally, if you pick up trash because it earns points, even while it may be good for the environment, how many other things are you not doing because the app doesn't recognize that socially responsible things, like helping someone carry their shopping, are also moral. The problem here essentially lies in how citizens and governments are treated as financially driven agents rather than morally driven agents, as Morozov points out. The consideration that governments are not companies and citizens are not consumers doesn't figure prominently in the gamification agenda. People's expectations may well have been reset. But in politics, people have more than expectations. They also have duties and obligations, which occasionally spoil all the fun. 
You might say, well, then why not have one app for the environment, one for political engagement, one for human rights, an endless number of moral functioning apps that all earn you points. This is just solutionism all over again. Problems that previously did not exist now become legitimate because we have the ability to track how people do these moral things. And now the moral implication of solutionism becomes more apparent. We may have made such actions more efficient, but we are no more moral for it, and personal growth is stifled. The longer you rely on apps and incentives to tell you what is right, whatever that is determined to be, presumably by whoever develops the app or supplies the incentive, then the further you become from thinking about the implications of your actions in moral terms, you essentially alienate yourself from morality. Ideally, we shouldn't need incentives for people to do the right thing. If you pick up someone's wallet, in all likelihood it is morally right to give it back to them. You might say that ideally lots of things ought to happen, but we don't live in an ideal society, to which I would agree, but I would add that it doesn't follow that we should abandon the traditional means of achieving a harmonious society for that end. Technological incentivization is also a recent and dramatic change in human behaviour. We didn't always have such incentives, and people did act morally. Why should we allow such a shift in our moral decision making to move toward technological incentivization if, say, for example, seven of the ten largest global corporations in the modern world have access to our eyes, ears, and data on a daily basis? Do we trust them then to become the arbiters of our morality, often when they are so clearly devoid of anything but capital? Big tech is no better than big oil, they just have shinier toys and tidier profits. What Michael Sandel points out in his book The Tyranny of Merit, about politics and technocracy, I think equally is true of how solutionism has changed our perception of morality. Not only has technocratic merit failed as a mode of governance, it has also narrowed the civic project. Today, the common good is understood mainly in economic terms. It is less about cultivating solidarity or deepening the bonds of citizenship than about satisfying consumer preferences, as measured by the gross domestic product. This makes for an impoverished public discourse. Again, notice the idea of people as financially driven agents rather than morally driven agents. Sandel is a frequent critic of monetary incentives and their corrosive effect on how people engage with morality. The point Sandel makes about public discourse is an important one. The debate around what is right and what is not that once was the focus of democratic citizenship is now being slowly eroded by technological solutions to things that, just 40 years ago, weren't even perceived as problems, and increasingly these solutions are being promoted for the profit of corporations that control what modern solidarity looks like. Does modern solidarity look like everybody having a Facebook account? Does it look like everybody having an Instagram account? And does it any longer include the idea that citizens actually have obligations to one another? It's important to address an obvious criticism of what I just said about how we view problems. There are some things which have been legitimate moral problems for thousands of years, such as the way we treat people of colour, women, the queer crowd. Also, yes, by the way, trans people have always existed. But that treatment was always perceived as a moral problem by the people within those groups, they were just ignored or silenced by the vast majority of the populace and the dominant power structures that made up society. The difference now is that we are talking about a technological trend to presume that things ought to be made more efficient because we can make them more so. But that decision is not removed from moral implication. One of the greatest misconceptions of the last few decades has been the idea that technology ought not to intrude on questions of morality that it ought to tread its own carefully delineated path, separate from that of humans and their political projects, like liberalism. Morality here, technology there, the two should never overlap. Here's an example of morality and technology colliding that, at first glance, doesn't seem to be of moral importance. The killbots? A trifle. It was simply a matter of outsmarting them. You see, Killbots have a preset kill limit. Knowing their weakness, I sent wave after wave of my own men at them until they reached their limit and shut down. Kif, show them the medal I won. And here's an actual example. You love to drive your car, 
However, your driving is statistically more likely to cause a fatal car crash than a newly designed automated car. Therefore, from a purely utilitarian view of reducing road mortality, it is less moral to drive a car than to let it drive itself. But when you make that decision to drive or not, you are exercising a moral muscle. You have made the call yourself, and you own that decision. You could have done the opposite, but realize that the right thing to do is to let the car drive itself. Now you might say, that's ridiculous, I'm all for smart technology, but this is where I draw the line. I want to drive, I'm going to drive, and I still consider myself a moral person. In this scenario, you did stop to think about it. You deliberated and decided that it's not necessary to let the car drive you to the supermarket, that's the key sticking point. You could, in a perfect world, happen to be driving Morozov, Nietzsche, and Camus to the shopping centre and discuss in depth the ramifications of your choice and whether it was actually moral or not. But we're making Irish hot chocolates tonight and somebody at some point has to go and get more milk. Now consider that the car does not give you the option of driving. After all, it's safer for the car to drive itself, it's less effort, it's more fuel efficient, automatically integrated into Google Maps for traffic updates, and you can do some work on your phone while you go to the shops. But you haven't thought about what you're doing. There was no deliberation, no exercising of that moral muscle, and ultimately no real choice being made. In this scenario, your lack of choice is entirely amoral and essentially amounts to a loss of agency. This one example might be okay, but if you experience this lack of moral decision making 10, 20, 30 times in a row, your muscles get weaker. Make no mistake, your choice to do the right thing, even when mundane and expected, matters, as does your resistance when you believe something is unjust. A similar method to incentivization that we use to make people do certain things is nudging, which is exactly what it sounds like. Gently pushing people towards, for example, driving electric cars, and highlighting the fact that it will save them money, which, while true, is not unproblematic. What if we want people to drive electric cars because they are good for the environment, in order to exercise those moral muscles again? One of these reasons is personal and financially driven, the other has community-wide moral implications. It's not that these aren't both true, they are, and they are both valid reasons that lead to the right thing, but it's about deciding which one of these is the right reason to drive electric cars. While the first reason has a monetary incentive and is easy to nudge someone toward, the second requires far more deliberation. Morozov points this out in his book when it comes to nudges, and the same holds true for incentives. If citizens come to care about Bosnia or Rwanda or Syria, not because they believe in the importance of humanitarian intervention, or deliberately seek out news about those lands, but because some combination of nudges and algorithms has made such caring all but inevitable, this seems like a tacit acknowledgement that deliberation and morality no longer command any respect in our political life, and that now it all boils down to what combination of incentives yields the desired action. It is notable that in technological examples the focus is on the ends, whether the right thing gets done. Whereas traditionally we have focused morality on the means, how and why you should do the right thing. Technology can be free from incentives and still work. iRecycle, for example, is an environmental app that helps you figure out which kinds of plastics can be recycled and what you can do with the ones that cannot be recycled. It not only helps reduce waste, but having actually sorted out and not offering any reward except knowledge in the identification of plastics, makes it more likely that you have actually thought about the choice to use it. This is at a cursory glance though, I haven't used it and I, I could be totally wrong. Incentives and nudges can be very effective, and often when used by governments or councils are great ways to help organise society, but they are also dangerous in their utility. They are so effective for app and software developers, social media companies, technology moguls in general, that they are hard to keep in check. Morality cannot be left to itself, it must be re-evaluated as often as it can be. Vigilance may be the key to securing our own kind of future. Before we move on, a quick note on the law. I already mentioned that as part of the exercise of your moral muscles, your resistance to injustice is just as important as your choice for justice. Sometimes this involves breaking the law, something with which we are now less acquainted than we used to be. Remember that for at least the last 200 years, most if not all human rights and legal precedents are set when someone breaks the rules and a court 
whether a legal one or that of public opinion, is forced to examine if those should actually be the rules in the first place. If we want the law to be morally sound, it may be within our interest to occasionally break it. Projects that pursue the right thing should always have a way through which the very definition of what counts as the right thing can be challenged and subverted. At the same time, laws must be a balance of individual liberty and collective responsibility. If it were mandated that we must pick up any trash when we see it and log it in our civil cleanup app, that would be a violation of liberty. And if we instill the right moral values in citizens, then it is also an unnecessary enforcement of collective responsibility, because we should recognize that that is a good thing to do anyway. Humans don't just write books and thrust them upon an omnipotent ruler who sees sense in them. We haven't truly done that for several thousand years. In order for new laws to be formed, civil disobedience and actionable moral ideals, such as the kind that incentivization may suppress, are of paramount importance. The submission of the general will is, whether you like it or not, a tacit endorsement of the current law. Part 4 Data and Tracking Quantifying the Self the most anticipated threat from technological ubiquity, as popularized by George Orwell's 1984, is surveillance. And while concerns about surveillance still exist, Hey Alexa! 1984 is far from the reality we experience today. Instead, there's far more concern in the data we voluntarily give away via self-tracking. Self-tracking is a growing trend, heralded as a way to catalogue life objectively, keep track of your achievements, self-improve and let everyone know it, and also, of course, to market yourself to a wider audience. Money truly makes the world go round. This is part of quantifying the self. You become the same as how many likes you get, how many steps you've taken. One of the dangers of quantification is that when we spend time working within a system and see the numbers that go in and the numbers that come out, we become less likely to attempt to change that system or think of different ways it might function. And we also find it very easy to slip into information reductionism. Focusing on calories, just because they are the easiest to count, is a somewhat defective way to think about nutrition. Whether they track calories or carbohydrates, the apps of the quantified self do not, strictly speaking, measure nutrition. They measure, well, calories and carbohydrates. This is an example of how the very complex science of nutrition, which usually has studies full of qualifying statements and footnotes in order to avoid being disastrously misinterpreted, becomes a simple equation of nutrients in equals nutrients out. This has had the same impoverishing effect on nutrition as a science as it has on democratic debate. While measuring aspects of your daily activities isn't necessarily a bad thing, it can quickly become obsessive, deceptive, and contributes to our fetishization of data. While the internet-centric argument would hold that more measuring of information, more access to information, and more sharing of information cannot be a bad thing. Changing gears quickly to surveillance, Gordon Bell is one of the foremost self-tracking pundits and has been recording every moment of his life since the late 90s by means of a sense can, a small box that hangs around his neck and takes a photo periodically. Naturally, he deals with the idea of replacing inefficient memory with efficient video footage. Bell writes in his book Total Recall that biological memory is subjective, patchy, emotion-tinged, ego-filtered, impressionistic, and mutable. Digital memory is objective, dispassionate, prosaic, and unforgivingly accurate. But that is simply not the case. How many times must we be told that something is not what it appears before we finally accept that CCTV footage of a man shoving another man with no audio in 144p, or the video of a cop pulling over a speeding driver holding a GoPro and yelling, am I being arrested? is not objective. We do not and cannot experience the world cinematically. The omission of information is the very reason we praise fantastic cinematography. It draws us in and makes us feel like we are part of the story. But we're not. We are being manipulated. Just as we are being manipulated while watching a viral video that's supposed to show some injustice change immensely just from literally swapping perspectives. When you watch a film, it communicates something to you through music, context, cinematography, often without detailing what actually happens. You're being communicated to with cinematic skill. If footage were all that were needed to communicate life subtleties, then we wouldn't score, edit, or color grade to manipulate audiences. 
We would just film with as much data on the screen as possible. Never would you see a silhouette rather than a face. Gordon Bell worked for Microsoft for many years, and while I have no doubt he is a competent programmer and technological expert, he is not a policymaker or philosopher, and it shows. He clearly understands very little about the implications of this enterprise towards quantifying the self. Sadly, Bell's book is so primitive that it barely pauses to mention that there are social or moral implications at all. It kind of just gives into the fatalistic view that this is going to happen anyway, so we will have to adapt. This implied inevitability of some kind of greater power that we must adapt to, rather than using it how we desire, is one of the many effects of internet centrism. In contrast to video footage, memory only remembers certain things, and it is all the more powerful for it. It doesn't catalogue the weather outside or the colour of the curtains. It reminds you how you felt the last time you talked to your grandmother, how she spoke, but not necessarily what she spoke about, and your deepest immeasurable regret now that she's gone. Morozov says of solutionism in general something that I think is a great point about memory more specifically. Why oppose such striving for perfection? Well, I believe that not everything that could be fixed should be fixed even if the latest technologies make the fixes easier, cheaper, and harder to resist. Sometimes imperfect is good enough. Sometimes it's much better than perfect. In our political, personal, and public lives, much like in our computer systems, not all bugs are bugs. Some bugs are features. Self-tracking is just another example of solutionism. Here is an inefficiency that needs no fixing, which is being framed as a problem to be solved. In keeping with the theme of memory, Alzheimer's is a problem. It is a loss of something that makes us human, our experiences, and we are poorer for those lost memories. You are not poorer, as far as I can tell, by not remembering how many nurses were in the room when your child was born. One very real danger here, of course, is that those memories can be subpoenaed by courts for evidence, or used for blackmail in both social or legal situations, or simply stolen. And what becomes of your right not to self-incriminate when it's your camera doing so? Bell notes that all those stored memories would be encrypted and safe, conveniently ignoring what every cybersecurity expert knows. That as far as we are aware, no encryption is ultimately safe because you cannot develop it to respond to something that doesn't exist yet. And when it comes to social policing or peer surveillance, Gordon Bell seems to encourage this behaviour and invokes the spirit of that classic line, if you've done nothing wrong, you have nothing to fear. There are many implications to believing what you do may be recorded and replayed. It could put you on your best behaviour. Antisocial behaviour could be exposed and condemned. You couldn't expect to get away with many lies. There is even some cold comfort in knowing that if I use my e-memories to harangue you over something you've done, you will have a copy of my harassment to use against me. I don't even need to point out how messed up that is, right? What becomes of the moral duty of citizens to one another when everyone resorts to blackmail? Again, the choice you make to be moral or responsible is a choice, and that choice and its power are diminished by such policing. Additionally, who is the arbiter of what is antisocial or what your best behaviour should be? When it comes time to figure out why John acted that way and yelled at Mary in front of her friends, from what we can see in her footage, there's no reason for that behaviour. But if John doesn't believe in capturing every moment, he never gets to tell his side of the story. And therein lies a very real social pressure to adopt a self-surveilling technology. Ultimately, technology like this which, while it may encourage you to be on your best behaviour, is corrosive to character because it gives you no choice but to do so. Part 5. Transparency. When it comes to transparency, things can get a little contentious. Again, it's hard to argue with the idea that more information isn't better. Complete transparency, however, is something that no legislator or philosopher would ever advocate for. Complete openness comes with a slew of sacrifices to rights and civil liberties, some of which are among the hallmarks of democracy. Some people advocate such openness because of its potential to let citizens keep watch over potentially corrupt governments or corporations, which makes sense but if anything, complete openness will have the opposite effect, as noted by Rousseau in his Discourse on Political Economy. Books and auditing of accounts, instead of exposing frauds, only conceal them. 
for prudence is never so ready to conceive new precautions as knavery is to elude them. Basically, if you know that your books are being looked at, you're more likely to be able to conceal illegal activity in them. This obviously begs the ethical question, how much of the inner workings of government or private enterprise do reveal to citizens, and how much strategy genuinely needs to remain opaque? The risk to the public good is that some citizens are potential criminals, and if they know exactly where you're going to look to catch them, they won't hide there. But it's not just outright criminal behaviour that transparency can spur. Too much transparency leads to violations of privacy, things like personal addresses, political donations, and personal income. Sometimes this information is good, but more often than not you miss the context for why a person did what they did, or simply gain information that it is not your discipline to understand, nor your right to access. The push for transparency is intrinsically tied to the tech sector and web developers because of their newfound power in the digital space, usually to collate and represent information in accessible ways. 8maps was one such website, developed for use in a political boycotting, intimidation and shaming campaign, led mostly by the group Californians Against Hate as a response to Proposition 8, an attempt to stop gay marriage in California which, while it passed, was later ruled unconstitutional. 8maps published the publicly available data of all donors in support of Proposition 8 on a map of California, which in itself was kind of okay until they also published privately collected data, such as their contact details, addresses, workplaces, salaries, etc., which they obtained simply by knowing these people's names. While 8maps was a huge breach of privacy and led to intimidation, death threats, lost jobs, and in some cases, ruined people's lives and reputations, there are some people who think such transgressions are okay, because after all, this is happening to their political enemies, not to them. Imagine the following situation. You are a bigot who supported Proposition 8, and you knew that your name and donation would be made public, and you also knew that using only your name we could find you. You chose to engage in politics anyway, so you should have expected retaliation. This is a viewpoint that resonates with many supporters of 8maps, who, while they do support gay marriage, and I want to make this very clear, do not represent the attitudes of most of the left. Now, flip that idea on its head and see how you feel about it. Imagine you were a financial supporter of, for example, Muslim women fleeing domestic abuse, and a right-wing extremist group held this viewpoint. Give money to support these immigrants, who are our ideological enemies, and with whom we are at war, and you are unpatriotic. We have your name, and now also your address, employment, and contact details. You chose to engage in politics you can expect violent reprisal. People who work at abortion clinics or in similarly contentious areas already know how dangerous these reprisals can be, even when their workplaces are the ones in the spotlight and when they aren't personally identified and targeted. Imagine the fear you might feel being one of the people targeted by extremists, and you might understand that 8maps was a problem, and thus that transparency is not always good. A report on the story of Proposition 8 and 8 maps is linked in the description. I recommend checking it out. Throughout the report, people come out on either side of the issue and many people in support of gay marriage condemn the methods and privacy violations perpetrated by 8 maps, like myself. But many people also stress that retreating back into a shell of privacy and lack of political accountability is likewise not an option. Brad Stone of the New York Times, while writing about 8 maps, highlights the fact that the internet has intensified this once noble goal of transparency. 8maps.com is the latest, most striking example of how information collected through disclosure laws intended to increase the transparency of the political process, magnified by the powerful lens of the web, may be undermining the same democratic values that the regulations were to promote. Ultimately, this demonstrates that a compromise between privacy and transparency has to be reached. They are in most cases competing goals and cannot be reconciled, which is precisely why internet centrism assuming one is an unparalleled good is such a problem. Transparency also slips into information reductionism. When a certain senator sponsors a certain bill, we have a right to know about it. But when we take all the bills a senator has ever sponsored, and give them a score for progressive or conservative values without knowing why they sponsored those bills, that quantification becomes deceptive. 
A fine example of such reductionism is given by Hibbing and T. Morse in their book Self Democracy, which shows that quantifying a politician by their publicly available data can be deceptive. The difference between a 100% attendance record and a 95% attendance record is invariably a smattering of inconsequential quorum calls. For those of you who don't know, quorum is just a term for having a certain number of a committee present in order to have a meeting uh, declared legitimate. The point being here that members often talk over the issue and all agree to something before the meeting occurs, thus making quorum and the actual meeting a pure formality. This of course would not be as big an issue if you read the minutes of those meetings too, but most people are just going to see that one politician only attends, say, 60% of the meetings to which they sit as a committee member, which admittedly looks problematic. This is not an abstract example. Political journals have started taking note of this statistic, which has only recently started being requested and published, and it has already become common to use such statistics in negative ads against political opponents. This reductionism and quantification distracts from other important work that a politician may have to complete, and ultimately the political process suffers as a result. Ultimately, by revealing the inner workings of politics and making it simple and efficient, when politics manifestly is not that, it is messy and complicated, you aren't going to make people who don't care more engaged in politics, or make democracy better, all you do is misrepresent it. Ironically for solutionists, quantifying politicians' attendance scores at meetings actually makes the already inefficient political process even less efficient. Complete transparency in a political sense also encourages self-censorship, just like watching your words when you know you're being recorded. Hey Google. Good to hear your voice. How can I help? At a certain point, transparency is surveillance. And if everyone is transparent except for you, that makes you look guilty, not private. Privacy and security are not just about keeping people safe. They are also about having spaces which are the opposite, exposed and vulnerable, which is where conversation happens. As Gallison and Minow write in Human Rights in the War on Terror, Given the complexity of the self, trying to reduce the privacy concept to a purely utilitarian framework is like steamrolling a statue to capture its essence in the simpler space of a two-dimensional plane. Such flattening may make security and privacy look like a simple balancing act, but it does nothing to acknowledge the space people need to deliberate. Notable, while I was writing this script, I received this email. How's that for serendipity? When we add transparency to the tracking and quantification of data, we almost invariably make it overly simplistic. Internet centrism has reinforced the idea that more data is only good, an idea that naturally leads us to want to record and make everything available to all people, without considering the consequences. Part 6. Not all doom and gloom. The last chapter of Morozov's book takes a much more optimistic tone, so naturally I just kind of tuned out. He talks about how the fates of technology, morality, and ultimately humanity that we've talked about are not in fact inevitable. Being in our control, technology can remain a tool that is compatible with the way in which we have designed our ethical world. I don't want to give the impression that either myself or Morozov are fatalistic. Indeed, when talking of internet centrism, he warns against fatalism and notes that feelings of inevitability are easy to fall into, especially with all the constant talk of revolutions. The paralyzing influence of apocalypse induces passivity and limits our responses to change, for the unfolding trends are perceived to be so monumental and inevitable that all resistance seems futile. And while Morozov does warn against these feelings of powerlessness and despair, and the mindset that accompany them, he also notes that there is no reason that most technology needs to fall into that inevitable category. But even if a certain technology does become inevitable due to, say, overriding material benefits, what Morozov emphasizes is avoiding this internet-centric view that all technological change is omnibenevolent. But to grant that technological fixes are unavoidable is not the same as to grant that they are all equally good or equally bad even if they get the job done. That they are technological means little, as technology says little about their moral import. If we do grant that technological does not automatically mean amoral or inhumane or anti-democratic, 
We'll have to investigate each and every technological system on its own terms, and imagine how a different technological system might achieve the same objectives in a manner more conductive to debate, reform, and deliberation. So no, all technology is not morally corrosive, and I'd never want to imply as such. Simply being thoughtful about how we approach and develop technology is the most important thing, especially as it becomes more powerful, more political, and more privately controlled. There are devices that Morozov talks about in his book that were intentionally developed to disrupt the way we think of technology. They currently sort of exist under the category adversarial design, the namesake of a book by Carl de Salvo, which Morozov does quote from. Adversarial design is exactly what it sounds like. Devices that deliberately cause some level of tension or friction with their intended purpose, to help people perceive everyday devices in a new way. Some of these technologies feel much more like art and design projects than functional pieces of hardware, but that doesn't mean they can't be made to work in a way that is more traditional and widely adoptable. Art, after all, is not entirely outside the realm of economics. Here's an example. The Caterpillar, which is an extension cord, seeks to make its owners think about the energy wasted by devices in standby mode. The Caterpillar has three modes. When the plugged-in device, say a TV set, is on, then the Caterpillar breathes slowly and unobtrusively. If it's off, it does nothing. But if it's in standby mode, then the Caterpillar starts twisting and turning, as if in pain. Will owners attend to its needs as they would for a living thing? Perhaps not. But as long as it adds depth and substance to their experience of using extension cords, the mission is accomplished. The designers deliberately want users to engage, even though they could have easily done the job for them. The Caterpillar could simply detect connected devices in standby and switch them off automatically. The Caterpillar's designers see friction, not efficiency or ease of use, as a productive resource that, properly deployed, can highlight complex issues that are very hard to see in a frictionless world. As I said, this is not a practical device, and maybe smart power boards which do turn things off when you're not using them are a good thing, and if we think of energy as a resource, then that is certainly a way to conserve it. But notably here the designers of this product see friction as a resource that we often throw away, and it is valuable too. If breaking the law is sometimes necessary to start conversations about the just nature of those laws, so too must we interrupt the passive way we think of technology, and talk about its application. The Caterpillar is not a slave that helps you solve problems by making things more efficient. It is a troublemaker that forces you to think about your preconceived notion of what technology is for. This very reasonable pushback against the pure functionality of devices, essentially a criticism of utilitarianism, is both broad and necessary. This view that everything can be quantified and reduced to a numbers game is deceptive and incorrect, as is the idea that functional, efficient devices are always better than their predecessors. Not every problem can be solved with technology, and no system is perfect or unreceptive to change. One thing we can do to stem this tide of seemingly inevitable changes to technology is disengage with the narrative that internet centrism perpetuates, both with regards to what is good and bad, and that previously successful models, whether financial like Amazon or cultural like Google, are at all applicable to other forms like politics or education. How our digital technologies unfold in the future will be a factor not of how the internet works or how computers work, but of how we choose to make them work. Some will need to rely on an ethic of openness and transparency, others on an ethic of secrecy and opacity, some will foster collaboration, Others will foster individuality and solitude. There's no great logic to the internet. Ultimately, I see no reason why that is bad. Being free of the dominating ideology of internet centrism, should we then not also be free to use technology to do what we want? People are complex and varied, which logically seems to preclude the idea that we can make something that is universally good. Or that if the internet had a mandate, that following it would lead to the right conclusion anyway. Devices like the Caterpillar allow for the fact that humans are complex creatures who can decide on the trade-offs of technologies themselves, and decide whether the device is worth using, which I guess is the main thing to aim for if you want to create technologies that help rather than hinder society. Additionally, incentives and nudges are precarious tools that have many applications, 
but extending them into the realm of moral reasoning has its problems. Off the top of my head, incentives that make it more possible for people to do things they want to do, such as a subsidy for opening a business, are less harmful than turning moral actions or responsibilities into games and systems for social point scoring and financial reward. If you want to hear more specifically about incentives and motivation, I would suggest checking out this video by Zoe B. She does a great job exploring motivation and talks about the link between reward incentives and diminished learning, especially with the addition of grading, which essentially is quantification. She approaches it from a perspective known as motivation crowding. Link in the description. Remembering that wanting to do the right thing, choosing to do the right thing, and having a thoughtful approach to the technologies you use and how they might affect your choices are all important. As I said, there's so much more to talk about in Morozov's book, and it's explained far more thoroughly and with more care than almost any book out there. From me, that's about it for now, but before I go, as always, I want to share something with you that you can go away and experience. Unrelated this time, I couldn't think of anything that immediately came to mind for the subject matter. Instead, here's something to read that isn't as heavy as Morozov. The Quest for King Arthur by David Day. This book is a fantastic look at the historical, allegorical, and literary origins of the King Arthur myth, and is both easy to read and informative just to the right depth. For anyone looking for an introduction to Welsh folklore or mythology more broadly, it sets a fantastic standard for future books within the space. There's some interesting philosophy in there too, actually, certainly worth unpacking. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please comment, subscribe, like, share, etc. But only because you want to. After all, it's the right thing to do. Thanks for watching. Stay safe, and I will see you next time.